Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Annalise Riles, Associate Provost for Global Affairs and Executive Director of the Northwestern Roberta Buffett Institute for Global Affairs here at Northwestern University. Northwestern University sits on the original homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and the Odawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and the Ho-Chunk Nations. We acknowledge and honor this history and recognize the ongoing dedication and importance of indigenous culture to the lands and communities with whom we live, learn, and work, and especially to the subject of discussion today, I would say. Uh, on behalf of Northwestern and uh, in especially the Roberta Buffett Institute for Global Affairs and the Trinans Institute for Sustainability and Energy, I'd like to warmly welcome you all to our campus. Um, this is uh, a absolutely co-sponsored and co-organized event with the University of Toronto, and I really want to thank our wonderful partners at the Climate Positive Energy Initiative and the Office for Vice President International who are with us today and have done so much to make this a success. So we're here today to launch um, a new global social innovation hub between Northwestern University and the University of Toronto. These hubs are a new model of strategic partnership. They're centers of collaborative research and learning and also um, uh, ways of partnering be between two leading institutions uh, and their local communities where there's opportunity to pool symbiotic strengths and achieve remarkable results in research and learning. And each hub will focus on uh, one or two key social, environmental, or economic issues. The hub with the University of Toronto will be known as the Toronto Northwestern Decarbonization Alliance, or TNDA. And through this hub, we aim to catalyze research on and transnational policy around progressive decarbonization, which is efforts to reduce and ultimately eliminate carbon dioxide emissions from energy generation to prevent further global warming. Um, and Northwestern and the University of Toronto, I think, are really uniquely positioned to join hands in this work. Both universities are undoubtedly global leaders in sustainability, driving innovation in this space. And um, of course, we share a lake between us, so we have that connection. And we also um, uh, have a long history of working together as individual researchers uh, and also institutionally as partners. So, um, so uh, this is uh, a bright future that we're all launching together today. And I'm thrilled that to launch this, we have with us today Northwestern University's president, Michael Schill who is Northwestern's 17th president. And I believe he took office almost exactly a year ago today, a year and a couple weeks. Okay, all very close. Um, he, uh, president Schill also serves as professor of law at the Pritzker School of Law and professor of finance and real estate in the Kellogg School of Management. Thank you so much, Mike, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Annalise. And I, I want to welcome everyone and our partners at the University of Toronto, as well as community members and visitors today. Um, it's, it's an honor to have you all here uh, for the launch of the University of Toronto Northwestern Decarbonization Alliance. Um, I want to give special thanks to Northwestern's Buffett Institute of Global Affairs, the Paula M. Trinans, Institute for Sustainability and Energy, Climate Positive Energy at the University of Toronto, and the Office of Vice President the, of the Vice President International uh, at the University of Toronto. Now, it takes a great deal, I mean, I just named off four different people, it takes a great deal of collaboration to put on an event of this magnitude, and I'm delighted that it has come uh, to fruition today. As higher education institutions, part of our mission is rooted in improving the conditions of the communities both that we live in as well, and that can be at various gradations of, of geography, near and far. I often tell our students that they should seek to make a positive impact wherever they may go whether that is as close as Evanston or whether it is as far away as Asia or Africa. 
Uh, and if one of our alumna has her way, we will be going to uh, Mars and, and even further. Uh, now, chief among the ways that we at Northwestern, as well as the University of Toronto, can make this positive impact is through decarbonization, renewable energy, and sustainability. And we at the university, we at Northwestern, are going to focus on these issues as one of our priorities, which will lead us forward over the next seven years. Uh, because to be frank, little else matters if we can't ensure a future for our students and for future generations of our, of our community and our Northwestern community. We have enormous potential here because of our combined excellence in science, business, law, and policy. And that potential is being realized by this alliance today. Our acclaimed Buffett Institute for Global Affairs is one of Northwestern's many assets that are being deployed by world-class economists, psychologists, political scientists, sociologists, engineers, and faculty. Just look at the faculty represented today. And we are grateful that the University of Toronto joins us as equal partners in this initiative. Our complementarity and our shared strength, as well as our aligned strategic visions, they position us well to drive innovation across the sectors. This innovation will reduce and hopefully ultimately eliminate carbon dioxide emissions from energy generation to prevent future global warming, further global warming, I should say. This group knows the importance of engaging researchers across the university, stakeholders across the sectors to address this, the most pressing global challenge that we have today. And this group is equipped to come up with new, interesting, important interdisciplinary research, scholarship, collaboration. And this group also will be giving the next generation, some of whom are in this room today, the roadmap for how to move forward in the future. I look forward uh, from basically just a block or two up the road, I look forward to witnessing the path-breaking discovery that will come out of this collaboration and seeing it applied to the entire world. And today, just like all of you, I'm looking forward to hearing the keynote speakers have actually a meeting. I've got to go to, I'm going to attend the first uh, keynote speaker. No pressure on you, whoever it is. Uh, the, uh, but I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say. Thank you all. Thank you so much, President Schill. Um, I'm now uh, equally thrilled to introduce um, my good friend, Gwen Burroughs from the University of Toronto. Gwen is the Assistant Vice President for International Engagement and Impact, what a great title, at the University of Toronto. Um, uh, the University of Toronto holds the presidency of the U7 Plus Alliance of Global Universities, which Northwestern is proud to be a member of. And uh, Gwen partners with uh, uh, Toronto's President Gertler in leading the Alliance of Universities in that work, among many other things that she does. And through that alliance, um, these 50 leading universities from around the world have unanimously committed themselves to set targets for reducing um, GHG admissions on their campuses. And uh, that was really Gwen's leadership in just, that's just one small example of the ways in which she has led around the issues that we're discussing today. Um, so um, Gwen, it's really an honor to work with you in so many capacities and just so delighted to see that in addition to all the multilateral work we're doing together, that our relationship is now taking this very, very substantial bilateral step as well. So welcome.
Thank you, Annalise. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to see U of T colleagues in the room. Uh, sometimes you have to travel elsewhere <laughs> to gather, but also to meet new Northwestern colleagues. I'm really looking forward to the couple of days ahead. And as Annalise said, to see old friends from Northwestern. We have a very strong collaboration over the last few years. And uh, I think a set of um, reinforcing mutual commitments to uh, really thinking about how universities can make a substantive difference in the world. And, and so this is beautifully aligned with that work. Um, the University of Toronto is committed to developing international partnerships uh, with other world leading universities, hence Northwestern here today, uh, in areas of mutual and or complementary uh, areas of strength. We develop partnerships for impact focused on some of the most pressing global issues of our time. And as you've already heard, uh, there is no more pressing issue than the one that we'll be considering over the next two days. And what we do through my office is we both support research collaborations, but also learning collaborations for all of our students. And so really looking forward to some of the substantive work that will come out of these discussions and be launched by them. The launch of the U of T Northwestern University Decarbonization Alliance, which of course, given Ted Sargent's um, <clears throat> leadership in this already has an acronym, uh, because <laughs> Ted is an exceptional leader, uh, but also a leader by acronym is a timely opportunity for both, uh, leveraging the diverse expertise represented by both U of T's Climate Positive Energy Institutional Strategic Initiative, as well as a number of other faculty who are aligned around these issues, and the Paula M. Trinan Institute for Sustainability and Energy at Northwestern. Um, again, complemented, I think, by a number of other colleagues who may not be affiliated by that. Pathways to rapid decarbonization require all of our creativity and diverse expertise and requires us to be able to communicate across disciplines from basic science and its implementation to considerations regarding climate justice and equity from effective community and industry engagement to policy engagement at all levels. So I particularly welcome the broad range of expertise represented in the room today and tomorrow and look forward to the substantive discussions as we identify opportunities for joint research and lay the groundwork for a set of multi-year collaborations um, that will contribute substantive progress towards decarbonization. So thank you all. Looking forward to joining you in the discussion. And over to Thank you so much, Gwen. And now I want to introduce the star of the show. So a couple of years ago, Gwen pulled me aside and said, you know, there's this new superstar coming to Northwestern. And Ted Sargent, who used to be the vice president for research at Toronto, and in addition to being a superstar scholar, he's going to be really well positioned to understand both of our institutions and get us to work together in a way that would be really exciting. So when Ted arrived, I gave him a call and he said, you know, I have this idea. And then here we are. So this is sort of how this came to be. Um, Ted Sargent is the Lynn Hopton Davis and Greg Davis Professor at Northwestern University. And he's appointed in both the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences, Department of Chemistry, as well as the McCormick School of Engineering's Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And he is the co-executive director of the Paula Trinan's Institute for Sustainability and Energy at Northwestern, and just such a critical part of our community already. Welcome, Ted. Thank you. Well, thank you, folks. Uh, it is great to be here, and thanks for all gathering together today. Uh, I stand between you and an actual talk, and uh, so I'm going to try to be brief. I have the pleasure, really, of kicking off our first two keynotes today, um, but I will just say uh, that I'm really here to represent this partnership, including uh, the Trinan's Institute for Sustainability and Energy at Northwestern as a partner with the Buffett Institute. And it's really alongside my co-executive director of the Trinan's ICE and Professor Mike Wazalewski, who's uh, agreed to join us and is with us here in the front row today, uh, that I'm uh, welcoming you to this exciting event. Uh, I'd like to just go right ahead and introduce our first speaker, which is Professor Imre Seman of the University of Toronto. 
Uh, Imre is director of the Institute for Environment, Conservation and Sustainability, and he's a professor of human geography at the University of Toronto Scarborough. He's a global leader in environmental studies, social and political philosophy. He's uh, really a founder in the field of the energy humanities, and he's co-founder of the Petrocultures Research Group. He's a member of the International Panel on Behavior Change, and he's a fellow of the Canadian International Council. Imra, we're really excited to hear your talk. Uh, welcome, and uh, let's get this thing underway. Go ahead, Imra. Okay, I hope I can get this um, going in the right way. Um, I have so many things I want to show you and talk to you about. I don't know if I'm going to get to them all, but I might skip around a little bit as a result. Um, but I want to start uh, by reading you something. I thought it would be a better way to start than to um, show you the next slide. So I'm going to read a quote. Um, if I can get it up. Motor power places gigantic forces at his disposal which, like his muscles, he can employ in any direction. Thanks to ships and aircrafts, neither water nor land can hinder his movements. By means of spectacles, he corrects deficits in the lenses of his own eye, thank God. Um, by means of the telescope, he sees into the far distance. And by means of the microscope, he... Um, he overcomes, this is not working, I shouldn't have done this, but anyway, here we go. He overcomes the limit of visibility set by the structure of his retina. In the photographic camera, he has created an instrument which retains the fleeting visual impressions, just as a gramophone disc ret retains the equally fleeting auditory ones. Both are at bottom materializations of the power he possesses of recollection his memory. Okay, so the person that wrote this, reflecting on what technology meant for human beings, described human beings as prosthetic gods. They, they exceeded the ability of their own flesh. They were able to do things that they weren't able to do before technology. This way of being in the world, I think we take for granted. Um, this we don't tend to look at the way that this impacts the societies that we inhabit, the way we imagine culture and what it does, and certainly how we think about politics. All right, this quote was written in 1930 by Sigmund Freud in uh, Civilization and its Discontents. In 1930, the amount of energy we were using per capita was not really that much more than at turn of the century, not really significantly more than in 1800, at least by comparison to the amount of energy we started to use post-1945 and that we use today. So when I tell my students about this vision that Freud is trying to figure out, we're prosthetic gods. Like we have a tool, but we have even more tools. We can see what we can't see with the eye. Um, I ask them to think about, well, what does that mean now? What does that mean in 2023? What are the powers that we have? And what has that done to who we are in the world? Now, whatever the energy humanities is, and there's a lot of things, and I'll be telling you a lot about it, um, these are the three areas of the talk. There's no way I'm going to get to all three of them, but I'll jump around. Um, I have half an hour, right? I don't have the afternoon? OK. Um, I'll try to keep track. Um, I want to try to at least touch on these three areas. So the first one is the energy humanities. Really, what the energy humanities tries to do is to make sense of the situation I've just described to you. It especially tries to make sense of what using a lot of energy does to us socially, culturally, politically. It suggests that there needs to be an investigation of this because it really hasn't been a focus of history, of cultural studies, of literary studies, of political studies. There was a, an analysis that is done. I'm going way off script. Okay, I'm going to stick to. I'm going to stick to it. Um, so the energy humanities wants to understand what it means to be prosthetic gods, and especially with a lot more energy. Um, this, whatever this field called the energy humanities is, it started about 
a decade ago at these two research institutes, one at Rice University and an organization at the University of Alberta. And it's kind of first articulated in an article in the Canadian uh, publication, University Affairs, which is kind of the Canadian equivalent of Chronicle of Higher Education in 2014 by Dominic Boyer, uh, my colleague at Rice and uh, myself. We kind of thought about what is this and what, um, how do we make sense of all of these books and articles and research that is being done in this field um, of now called the energy humanities. Somebody asked me, um, it, was, it was my colleague, Dave um, Stinton, which thank you, Dave. He asked me if there's a lot of work yet in this field. And there is in fact an enormous amount of work. There's incredible amounts of scholarship coming out in history, um, in politics, in sociology, in anthropology, perhaps especially in anthropology, in human geography, um, you name it. There's even this fantastic graphic novel called Gasoline Dreams that's listed there. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about each one of these books just in passing, but there's even a lot more. And I could go and these, these covers could go smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. So really fundamentally, I think what's at the core of this field is the idea or the notion that energy is a social relation. It's not just a fuel. What I mean by that and what I think energy humanists mean by that is that it's not just a neutral energy is not just a neutral input into pre existing systems. So that you can swap in and out energy and whatever is happening else history kind of happens on its own. Um, and you can just swap in and out fuel. Um, and what that means is some of what I've been saying is that energy gives shape fundamentally to our um, material social and cultural conditions. It's important to how we are as people, our subjectivities. It's important to our ways of life. Fossil fuels have shaped modernity. It shaped the structures and practices of modernity. It's given rise to the political systems we have. And if we didn't have as much energy as we do now per capita, um, more in many places than others, of course, we would have fundamentally different systems. Why that's important is that this is not, I'll just say it again, we haven't really taken account of this. And so a lot of the work that energy humanist does is kind of foregrounds energy in its analysis of um, many different topics. And why this is especially important, I think, and why it's maybe important for this meeting here, is that if it's, it is the case that fuel isn't neutral, that it shapes social systems, it gives rise to how we are in the world, that at a moment of energy transition, we have to then give some thought to how older energy systems have made us into the societies we are, the people we are, so that we can kind of take into account both how practices, social practices, political practices can help energy transition along, but also what might be the consequences of energy transition. Main areas of research, this kind of intervention into previous ways of doing things. I think looking at gaps as well in how we have thought about energy, rewriting, rethinking energy, and kind of posing challenges for energy transition. And I'm just going to give you some examples and really short descriptions of some uh, some of these books. So certainly one of the one of the big impacts that energy humanities has made is in the area of history. There have been histories that have re-narrated how energy works and its impact historically. One of the most important ones is this book by Andreas Malm. I would even say it's kind of a founding text called Fossil Capital. Um, Andreas Malm is now better known, much better known, or become publicly known for a book called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. But he really, at core, is a historian, and he did this analysis here. There's a, there's a simple thesis to this book that is elaborated um, in a lot of detail because it's, it's complex what it means. He challenges the notion that technology is the driver of history still a very prominent notion, one that is kind of the go-to notion of how things move along in modernity. And he suggests something else is at, is at work. What he looks at is the advent of the steam engine and its function in the production of cotton. He says that the steam engine, born in 1776, was not widely used until the mid 1820s. So the question is why? Why if the steam engine is the driver of history, a kind of a fundamental thing people point to. 
Um, so you can kind of line up the steam engine with, I don't know, the solar panel next or whatever you want in between refineries. Um, why was it not used right away? The story he gives has to do with energy cost and what energy is for, but especially how energy works with labor. Energy, um, the advent, the use of the steam engine in factories in the 1820s in cities uh, came about because of a need for fact factory owners to control labor in cotton factories. Okay. For, through a variety of things that happened in the 1820s, um, including riots that occurred around cotton use, um, um, there were recessions around cotton. But especially, this had to do with the move away from one energy system to another the use of water wheels and windmills to power cotton production outside of cities, the energy return on those systems was much higher than what steam engines could produce. And so there's a, there a prolonged movement of, of the adoption of this um, system, and it had to do with control over labor. This is also a thesis in a different way of this book by Timothy Mitchell. I would also say this is a foundational text which looks at what happens to practices of labor in the switch from coal to oil. Um, coal miners had a really powerful um, tool at what they can employ in labor struggle, which is that they just stand in front of the, on the rail line, or they stand in front of the mine entrance. And this Mitchell looks at the way in which this was important for the unfolding of the labor movement worldwide. With the switch to fossil fuels, you, it's much more it's harder to do that. You don't even know where pipelines are often. And indeed, the level of labor organization in fossil fuel production is not even close to what it was in, um, the, in carbon and in, in coal production. Indeed, I'm not sure there's any unionization of any significant levels in um, once there was a shift to oil as a predominant fuel source. I'll try not to go. Uh, Quite this slow. Um, fascinating recent book about the Fuxuan um, open pit coal mine and its impact on the Chinese Revolution and its role in the Chinese Revolution, both pre revolutionary China and after that, its impact on the people there. This also has to do, again, I think uh, Victor uh, looks at the role of bodies in relationship to technology. So, in the case of this open pit mine, the, the adaptation, uh, the adoption of new forms of um, uh, tool of technology to uh, get more coal out of the mine here did not did not reduce levels of labor used. It, if at anything, it increased it. And he does an analysis of why this is the case, specifically looking at what happens through the through 20th century China. And finally, there's this interesting book of really political philosophy, looking at the ways in which the idea of energy what came to be um, in the, the late 18th century, early 19th century, and its function in every, all kinds of things, in how we think of work primarily, both work socially, um, but also work, of course, in, um, in, in science and in economics. It certainly is in politics, political analysis. So I'll, I'll say these a bit uh, more quickly. So David Hughes, uh, went to a small town in Spain, which was already surrounded by wind farms and who were objecting to the wind farms, um, but then did a kind of close analysis, lived there for a long time to figure out the vexed and complex politics of what that's about. It certainly wasn't about NIMBY, NIMBYism, it was about something else. Similar kind of analysis of the um, imposition of wind farms off the coast of, of Mexico and its implications on indigenous communities there. Again, trying to give a complexity to this narrative, um, give, given, I think, what one, uh, I guess, making more complex than either the government wants to position it out there or as the community might want to get out there. What, what governments will tend to do in these kinds of situations when they own the power sources, they'll treat the objections of local populations as nimbyism and take on the role of kind of saviors of the environment by making that kind of decision to go into a clean energy system. Much more theoretical or philosophical work. Um, this one by Alan Stokel uh, looks at and tries to adopt the philosophy of uh, Georges Bataille, French philosopher of the 20th century, into thinking about energy. 
and I would say some of my own work kind of covers all of these different areas, interested in what's happening in Canada, Canada politically, looking at some of the history of energy and certainly thinking about energy at the present time through, I suppose, political philosophy and its um, and what this is doing for what we can imagine as a philosophy uh, in conjunction with um, with re renewable energies. Oh, there's more. I'm sorry. Um, there are memoirs. This is a memoir by uh, a scholar who's now at the University of California, San Diego. He's a Canadian. He grew up in a in a city in northern BC um, as an immigrant, Indian immigrant. His family grew up there. It was called Gen Peg. I think they just stuck together. Like I can't remember the nearest town, but they took Winnipeg. It was the name of the town. So it was a fictional town. He had he realized really recently in his life that there was a large indigenous community there, and that as a child growing up there, he had never even known it, never noticed them. Somehow they're written out of the picture. So this memoir, it's a kind of recollection of his own life, but it's also about his encounter with the community there and learning about what this hydroelectric dam, which was being constructed there, meant for this community. And finally, I think another foundational text, Amitabh Ghosh, he, he in this uh, text, he asks a pretty simple question, but the, it's alarming what comes back from it. There's two different questions. So one is, given the importance of the, um, of the Middle East for the United States, why is it that there are almost no fictional accounts of that encounter in US fiction? Indeed, why does the Middle East not show up very often at all in US fiction of the 20th century? What's going on there? This kind of absence or inability to read or note energy and its significance, even geopolitically. He would also say that until recently with climate fiction, no fiction deals with energy. And that too is an absence that he wants to understand or to narrate. And I, would th I think a lot of what energy humanities tries to do is kind of fill in these gaps and try to understand why there are absences. And I'll just kind of talk about some of these a lot. So some of the work that I do with my students and my students do is precisely about this. It's about trying to see why energy is so deep into our lives that we don't even recognize its significance. Going back to Freud. Freud in 1930, 100 years ago, says we are becoming something other than human. We should see ourselves as other than human. In 2020, 2023, perhaps not so much, but 10 years ago, this just wasn't part of the conversation. It didn't seem to be significant. Um, so a lot of those books that I've been showing you try to fill in the picture, but still there's this work of trying to make energy visible. And there's also, when it comes to representing energy, um, there's this kind of conflict. There's this attempt to both uh, reinforce the status quo and contest the status quo via images. If I had to kind of describe, I've always, people ask me what I do and I, I kind of like fumble around because I'm not really that sure maybe, or I don't have like a good pitch, but what I, what I look at is culture and power. And these are sort of some examples of how that comes up with respect to energy. This idea of visibility, invisibility, of trying to render visible even though something should be visible to you given its importance. This looking at the way in which examples of representation and counter-representation try to keep the landscape of how we think of energy either visible or invisible. Okay, so I'm just going to be giving some examples of that in quick discussions. So here we get an example kind of par excellence of an attempt to render something visible. This is the work of the Canadian photographer Edward Bertinsky. He took, uh, he takes large-scale photographs from a slightly elevated position. And he was able to do this at the Alberta tar sands. And until 2000, I would say, perhaps even a little bit later than that, there was very little sense of what this extraction site looked like. And thus, there was fairly little um, contestation of it. Um, it. These photographs were alarming. The idea of the scale of it and its impact became quite well known. There are other people that have since tried to, I guess, make other kinds of representations of it, make sure that you could see this, put this out on the map, and there's an active ongoing contestation about it precisely because of this kind of work to make things visible. Here's an example. 
of trying to push it back under the bed, so to speak, into the darkness. And this is, um, these are bus ads that were put out by the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. They have a very different sense of what uh, oil looks like. Okay, they, here there are um, engineers, I, I know there are a lot of engineers in the room. Okay, I don't, this is no uh, offense against engineers, but these are engineers um, chosen, I think, to, to make sure that there's some gender representation. Um, and they speak to some of the things that are happening with the oil sands. The, the oils are, oil is never mentioned. All you see is that there's the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers are producing it. You can go to that website, but you have these kind of um, inoffensive comments. You know, clean air is essential. I have no issue with that. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that was, you know, it's pretty blue on the bus. There's other things I wouldn't like to look at that are on the side of the bus. But this is this kind of attempt to then, if you look at the, that website, it's really suggesting that something like Bertinsky is the wrong way to view it. Or it's even trying to say, don't be worried about it. Or it's even doing something that Bertinsky can't do, which is Bertinsky shows up those images in a uh, museum or in, a, in an art museum and these show up in your everyday life so it took a very long time in canada for there to be any um, anxiety about the tar sands longer than one might expect um, and there are um, surveys that that suggest that so again this is just kind of some other examples about what often happens with kind of counter narratives against opposition to oil sands so this is again the canadian association of petroleum producers and they are connecting your interest and your commitment to oil to your commitment to your country. Okay. I mean, I should, I can't tell if you can read it. I'll just read it. It gets us to work, allows us to do our work, and makes us better when we can't work. It's a little overstatement of work there, but nevertheless. <laughs> it powers our classrooms, connects us to the world, and helps us make products that are vital to our lives. We're fortunate to have energy the world needs, but we have a challenge in getting it there. Okay, so Canadians made oil, it's good for Canadians. Why is all, there all this fuss about it? What is the problem? So here's this kind of assertion of a status quo, given all this new attention that's being done to, um, by activists, but also this kind of scholarly attention too, I would say, about what exactly oil has made us and how we might think of it differently. Now, interestingly, this is kind of affirming precisely those histories, I would say, that the energy humanities also does. Because it says, yeah, look at this. This is kind of a variant of, of, uh, of the Freud, said for different reasons. Right? It does everything for us. We are these things. How could we do anything without it? Be proud. It's Canadian. And luckily, holding up your hand like this looks like a maple leaf, so that sounds handy. I was in... Um, uh, my favorite cafe in Toronto, very, very far away from Alberta and the contestation over the oil sands. And this streetcar went by in 2018. Um, this narrative of stop Saudi oil um, has been used before 2018. Started in Canada in 2010 with this book by Ezra Levant called Ethical Oil, where he makes a strong case that there are better and worse kinds of oil. Um, there are friendly, liberal, happy oil, like the Canadian variant. And then there's Saudi oil that leads to stonings, execution, homophobia. The idea is if you, if you commit to Saudi oil, you're doing all these terrible things. But that's not really the message. The message is Canadian oil is better. Don't go after Canadian oil. If you're going to try to do something against Canadian oil, you're affirming the necessity of this other kind of there was then long discussions about whether you can possibly ever know whether your oil is Canadian in Canada, because um, we refine almost none of it. Um, so probably, probably not. Okay, I, I did joke with some colleagues that we should start an oil, uh, a gas station that explicitly just sold Canadian oil and then um, use the funds to uh, for institutes and centers and so on. But that, that didn't go very far. All right. <laughs> Um, this is Adam McDonald's in Edmonton, Alberta. This seems like a completely innocent thing. My, um, well, maybe it doesn't seem innocent, right? 
Um, my, uh, when I arrived there, I found this alarming. It's next to a play place. And uh, what I was told is at some point on this pump jack, kids were allowed to run around on it as well. My neighbors um, and my colleagues in Edmonton when I first got there, when I was trying to describe to them this pump jack at a McDonald's at a prominent intersection, they didn't know what I was talking about. It had become so much part of their landscape and so domesticated and so much part of what Alberta is. If you drive from Calgary, major city, to, to Edmonton, major city, three hours away, pass pump jack after pump jack after pump jack. Um, this is just kind of an experiment I did with my students to get them to uh, write about how this pump jack connects to almost everything else in the world. So first of all, mass food production and what that means, amount of energy it uses, um, to senses of home, to ideas of how children should be, to the energy that children might use, and so on. Um, again, images. Um, images that might be used against those Canadian petroleum producer images. So here we have two. Um, these, were not, these were the one on the, uh, I never did this. The one on the right, because it's not the same here, was used at the North Dakota, um, North Dakota pi pipeline. Um, North Dakota pipeline protest by Nicholas Lampart. The one on the then uh, left is actually an image that Lampart used. It's of a photograph that is not of um, the resistance in North Dakota, but it's, uh, it's taken from a photograph by Ozzy um, McClinn of Amanda um, Polchis, Micmac protester in North Dakota, who was standing up against the RCMP. And he was making it into badges that the North Dakota water uh, defenders could uh, put on. Um, and so there's this kind of sense of trying to build networks, build communities to show that there are the same kind of struggles being that like, taking place in different places. And again, using visuals against those kinds of visuals that are in play to try to make everything seem normal. Um, just really quickly here, this is a series by the photographer Judy Natal. She's from um, Louisiana. And what Judy wanted to do is she wanted to look at the energy coast between Houston, New Orleans, and try to look at what, what that looks like after Superstorm Sandy. Um, and she took these various kinds of photos, some which are, get, are saying that everything is fine. Right? Um, uh, the sign is amazing. No one gets hurt ever. Um, which the counterfactual, that always raises the counterfactual to me. It's like, are you supposed to get hurt at these kind of refineries? Um, and then looking at the remnants of, if you're in a different part of that energy coast after a Superstorm Sandy. Some things happen, some things don't. And of course, Superstorm Sandy, perhaps being a climate-induced weather event. Something uh, similar um, set of things from 2016, not entirely similar. These are meant, these are by Marina Zarkao. They're meant to be printed out um, and put wherever. She suggests you print out a bunch of them and put them in filling stations, kind of where you pick up um, flyers that are, might be sitting there. Or you put them in a schoolyard. Or you um, put them in compost. People might see them. And what she has in mind with this is something that I maybe I'll be able to get to a little bit as well, which is this necessity of building bridges with those that might feel differently about the kinds of the kinds of energy that we use. So not taking people directly on, but saying, let's start to go there. Let's start to say there. Salute the superstorms um, might produce a conversation. Somebody might say, what are you talking about? Um, but it might not be activists. It might not be environmentalists. It might be people that went through it and had never really thought about how their their jobs might be connected to it or the way that their communities use oil might be connected to it and so on. And then um, a part of the whole process of the energy humanities is, I think, this kind of thing. So um, I went with some students to the Canadian Centre for Architecture. And what we started with is this idea of figuring out when it was that in Canada and the US, there was um, the first text public texts or public facing texts that came out about solar homes. And we are discovering that these were from the 1960s, early 60s. And again, this idea that you could already have a, um, 
um, this practical guide that had been somehow lost to history, that there's this kind of failure of the idea, once again, that new technologies drive history along, um, but that other kinds of things can intervene that push things away, that make other things come up, um, that don't allow some things to emerge. So that whatever else is happening, again, in energy transition, it's going to be contested. It's not going to be directly forward. There were already other moments that there could have been energy transition. There's reasons that they fell away. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, we also discovered these board games that were produced in the wake of the 1973 oil crisis. There are a lot of them, surprisingly. Um, I could not find one to buy, unfortunately. Also, we tried to play one. They're really badly designed, They're really boring. <laughs> They're really boring. But still this idea that this is so present, so prominent, so important. I think 1973 is often turned to as an example of this sense that something needs to be done and the way in which that can be lost to vision, lost to memory, that there's a kind of a critical work. Perhaps this is what I'm kind of emphasizing over and over. There's a critical work that has to be done within the social sciences and humanities around how we deal with energy, how we come into contact with it, how it works socially, if it's visible socially, if it's invisible socially, and um, learning about the way in which we have all learned about energy or failed to learn about energy. Um, this, is, this is not me, this is a colleague of mine. Bart Beattie is a comic book researcher, seems like a great job to me. And he recognized, uh, he, he was curious um, why it was that whenever in a comic book, an action movie, um, a science fiction movie, why when they're using energy weapons, it, the energy is invisible. Okay, because it drove him, he's a bit of a nerd, drove him crazy that when you shoot a laser gun, there's like a bolt of energy that travels right to your victim. Um, of course, that's just effect, but it had to come up somewhere and it came up in this about a year and a half um, Jack Kirby, well-known um, Marvel um, uh, illustrator of Marvel comics, it came up with this idea of something that would be exciting for children to be able to see. It's kind of been used ever since. And so once again, there's this, there's this way in which energy is represented. Um, there's a loss of memory. This seems kind of trivial, but I think this is actually kind of important to how we interact with energy, how we think about it, if we think about it. Just a project I do with my um, students, I send them out and say, take photographs of energy apparatus. Um, if you were walking down the street, uh, you would not see either of these, I guarantee it. You would just walk down the street. If you send somebody out, they can take out, and for this project, they take an enormous, enormous amount of photos of the infrastructure that's there all the time. And that knowing of that infrastructure changes how you can think about it, how you interact with it, where it is, where it isn't, what that might be, what the significance of it, that might be socially, um, what kind of commitments are being made to different kinds of energy systems, and so on. These two, um, these two photographs are taken right near the, the new um, Museum of Modern Art in Toronto. Um, one you can see is run by solar panels. That's the bike share um, set of bikes there. And the other is right outside the Museum of Modern Art. And it's interesting that some place that has spent so much time on aesthetics is okay with this. <laughs> I'm not even sure you need that, quite that apparatus to, to uh, get um, energy to it. But um, again, this kind of sense, this play of visibility and invisibility, um, representations on film, how that works with, in this case, ideas about masculinity. Um, one is, I, I never know how old people are, so this is, uh, on the left is an image of the soap opera Dallas, ran for 13 years, it was about the Ewing family and their uh, trials and tribulations with Ewing oil. Interestingly, post 73 and the decline and collapse of, the, of Texas oil as a feasible business model. So um, interesting to go back and look at it now and how um, America was thinking about energy in relationship to, again, senses of family, of heritage. So on five minutes, excellent. 
Okay, so then I'm going to go ahead to this very interesting thing, and I'm going to stop here. Um, then you can see some of these ways in which we think about energy socially in the most tr perhaps trivial of objects. In um, Canada changes the way its money looks okay, I, um, to a degree that other countries do not. Um, on the left is the new $10 bill. It is a model of how a country, wait, on the left, yes, um, wants to imagine itself. It's been in circulation since 2018. That um, gray here, well, the guy there on the uh, right side is losing his hair. Um, first Prime Minister of Canada, John A. Macdonald, who has now been widely criticized for his colonial practices, even while Prime Minister and certainly before that. He's been replaced by the uh, by Viola Desmond, who would be considered the Canadian example of, the, of um, like the Canadian variant of Rosa Parks. She did not move when she was asked to from one part of a movie um, uh, from a uh, when she went to see a movie, a movie theater to another. Um, even though here she is, she's light skinned. The movie theater is dark. She was arrested. Now, this was in 1946. So in reimagining the dollar, and I swear I'll get, I'll do the five minutes. Um, there's an overcoding. There's this kind of anxiety here to this dollar bill. I think you don't just have Viola Desmond. You have an image of the Canadian Human Rights Museum on it. You have a golden eagle feather representing Indigenous communities, and you have which you can't read. You see here, you have this little clip in French and English from the Canadian Charter of Human Rights, Section 15, they, they pick the, the most banal part. It's like pure legalese. It has no kind of uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité. It's not that kind of thing. It's not in God we trust. It's just like, could it, it could have done better. Okay, anyway. Um, so before this, this isn't the immediate series right before it. This is a series from 1971 to 1989, the money I grew up with. And on the back of the $10 bill there, you had the polymer chemical factory in Sarnia, Ontario, um, nearby. Okay. Um, always was fascinated by it, didn't understand what this was. Um, the, polymer the polymer refinery was on there in part as a celebration of Canada's contribution to World War II. They produced synthetic polymer rubber uh, in support of the war, and that's why this made it on there. Perhaps the more significant thing is that this was part of a series called Scenes from Canada. This in 1971 to 1989 is how, the, how Canada wanted itself to be seen around the world. It's how it imagined itself, right? So here are the other um, bills, right? Each one of them is a site of extraction. You have a vision on the $1 bill of the Parliament of Canada, seen from Laval, but what is significant is not the Parliament, you can barely see it through the trees, but of a boat collecting up the lumber that is going down the Ottawa River. You have on the $2 bill, no longer in existence, sadly, you have some um, colonialists coming to make their way in and through Canada. You have a fish trawler and the $5 bill. And on the 100, you do have um, kind of an iconic image that is not only just of extraction, Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, but certainly there too, what is important is the shipping industry there. Very interesting that this is the representation of scenes of Canada. All right, so I will talk about that. I mean, I'll just say I have one other thing, and I'll end with this. This is this giant mural in Toronto. It is now in a liquor store. The staff don't really understand it. Uh, they don't even notice it. They always they wonder why I'm interested in it at all. Maybe some of you know where this is. Um, this was commissioned by Imperial Oil. Um, in 1954, um, they commissioned a modernist painter, York Wilson, to give them something that would recognize how important they were, recognize how powerful their company was, how, how, it, how interesting it was. They were definitely working off the model of uh, Rockefeller's commission of 
um, for the for the Rockefeller building, which we know where that went. Um, Diego Rivera short lived mural there. This is another vision of oil at a different moment. You have jet fighters flying in the sky on the left. It's like God coming out and emerging amazingly into this void light streaming around. Now this is this is that image of of prosthetic gods perhaps and connecting it to culture to the culture of, of modern painting that is one of the kinds of things that perhaps we need to pay more attention to if we think about decarbonization especially if we're going to move towards successful decarbonization thanks so much Oh, well, then I have more time. <laughs> Thank you, Emra. We're going to give ourselves maybe five minutes or so for just a couple of questions from the uh, audience. And, um, uh, and then uh, we'll also have a break after that everybody's most welcome at for further discussion. So I just wanted to open the floor right up. Does anybody have any questions for uh, Professor Emra Zeman today? Nayak. Yes, I uh, really appreciate the context of human relationship being a part of their education. To be back in the backdrop, there are almost 7 billion people who are part of this system. And as the Western world needs to be able to understand, how do you think where this guy is? On the one hand, you have a very large number of folks who would like to have cheap energy. At the same time, if you look at the scale and the scope, and the numbers are just astronomical. So how do you see the solution being emerged as we see uh, the problem? So I don't know if the, question, the, the solution would emerge from this kind of analysis. But what this kind of analysis would which, which suggest is why those kind of questions haven't been asked and why there's such a distinction, such a huge distinction between the amount of energy being used in one place and another, and how that came to be. That's the kind of thing that would be looked at. Or would, if I may uh, push this a little further, and what are the advantage of that energy source that has had for so long? And how do you expect the change, human behavioral change, that would occur or would need to occur with the new sources at the scale and the, and the scope is just so enormous? That's why we have to get to work on it. I mean, if, if part of when I get this kind of question, usually, and I don't want to presume what your question is, it's to suggest that I think often, oh, we need new technologies to come in and make that happen. Or if we don't need new technologies, we need new technologies, but over a certain period of time, they can't possibly come in fast enough. There's some kind of demand being made on human behavior that's far too much. Um, or we have to keep using existing forms of energy and we just come up with ways to manage it. Okay, so I'm from Alberta. Um, my friends from high school, they all are kind of doing carbon capture utilization and storage technologies. We have fights over beer. Um, so I don't know if any, the, what this kind of, a, a, the study of the social uses of energy isn't to say, let's immediately go to degrowth, um, whatever that would look like. It's precisely to ask questions about, well, how would you do that? How would you do that motivation? What, are, what, kind, what is happening and what is working or what is not if you go to these sites where there are transition happening? If you go to these local communities in um, Mexico on the coast, how are people resisting it? Why are they resisting it? Maybe we need to learn more about the context in which that's happening. Um, there are other examples I can give you where there are communities that never had energy, precisely as you're saying, like small communities led by women on the island of Zanzibar who have made the leap, never having had any energy source or really inconsistent energy source from the mainland to create solar co-ops. And what that has meant for their the livelihood of their communities, but also their social relations. So I suppose it's kind of mapping that out. I think that having such a complex history such a re deep relationship with energy and really it's fossil fuel energy it's that huge amount of energy over 200 plus years it's 
incredibly difficult to pry one out of that. And I suppose, you know, the message is, let's not expect that that's going to happen unless we pay attention to that. I'm very resistant to the idea that you luckily come in with the right kind of energy and you're fine. I mean, I would say that one of the things my call, I won't go on and on, but one of the things my colleague, a colleague and I are looking at is kind of various forms of green techno utopianism that are emerging, especially from Silicon Valley, where the idea is you can continue to be exactly as you are, but now you just clean up either the consumption part or the production part. And so nothing has to be done. Um, I don't think that technology will do that work for us. I also think that we'll still be those prosthetic gods. We'll just have cleaner energy. We'll probably use a lot more of it. Um, we still won't do other types of things, right? I tend to focus on the use of energy um, and not things like concrete. There's no concrete humanities yet. Um, you know, there's no, uh, I, don't, I don't even know what the next thing would. There's lots of other sites that produce greenhouse gases. Perhaps the burning of energy is just one of them. Um, so it's kind of doing that type of work. And I, I mean, I take your point that the, always the struggle now is going to be um, how do people that have not had access to become these Freudian creatures? It's great. Why would now they, that's like an injustice to not give that capacity to these people. So then the question is, what does the next 30, 40, 50 years look like if we both have to navigate a transition and make sure we do it in a way where everybody has a lot more access to energy? It's never about less energy. It's about different relations to it, different kinds of energy to enable us to still be people that are filled with a kind of a prosthesis. Thanks, Imran. And thanks, Fanatic. We've got time for uh oh we got a lot of questions why don't we'll just take two more questions we'll go first with Cecina, and then we'll go to uh, the gentleman in the green shirt we'll start with professor Cecina Hyland. all right thank you i actually have a very concrete question for you um in your studies have you ever come across shall i say insidious efforts to put images that are very pro energy within say movies or artwork uh, one of my favorite movies with my kids was um, monsters versus aliens and there's a scene where somebody comes out of hibernation and says oh such an inconvenient truth there's no global warming happening um, and I, I just wonder where that came from and and if you've encountered uh, significant numbers of this I haven't, uh, nothing leaps to mind, but I would say there are genres that are energy genres. So science fiction film, um, the, the USS Enterprise never fuels up. Um, even if they're using some kind of nuclear energy or the, you need, uh, yeah. They never eat, and it seems like, anyway, we won't go there, but I think action films, action films for sure, again, just this sense of the thrill of that other kind of prosthesis, and it's never present what's there. Not explicit, as you're asking. Um, I will look for that, though. Great. Thank you. We've got time for one more question from the gentleman in the green shirt. Has in the last 40 years, oil has become like a symbol of Canadian nationalism since the Quebec separatism the, whether it's liberal or conservative governments have used oil as a symbol of Canada as a country. Have they? Is that the question? Yeah. Um, they certainly, they certainly have, with to different degrees. So, without question, the connection, the development of neoliberal governance in Canada is closely connected to its reassertion, a public reassertion, even stronger affirmation of it being a resource extractor, even in a technological age. So when I show you scenes of Canada, that already tells you that's a big part of Canadian life. In 2000, it becomes very powerfully located around the tar sands, and it's through the conservative government at that point. Current governments are really wishy-washy on this. Um, they're not certain what they should do, but I would say if it's not foregrounded as something that is important to Canadian life, 
it's certainly enough there that oil companies can seize on it to do that work. And, and so does the conservative government in a way that you see played out um, by Trump in his somehow deep desire to reopen coal mines. Um, and there it's this kind of expression of a previous fantasy imaginary of, of uh, US life with soda fountains and um, so far American graffiti, uh, US. Um, and Canada doesn't quite work that way. In Canada, it's about that kind of extraction is what guarantees participation in modernity. Uh, it's become more complicated now with um, the rebirth of um, the, e the, the EV car industry. And it's uh, very messy right now, I would say. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Imra, for your presentation today and for a good discussion. And look forward to continuing the conversation. Please join me in thanking Imra once again. <laughs>I have the privilege of introducing our second keynote today. This is going to be from uh, Professor Kim Susia from Northwestern University. Uh, Kim is a faculty member in the Department of Political Science and the Environmental Policy and Culture Program, affectionately known as EPC, at Northwestern University. She's also a faculty affiliate, affiliate with the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research and the Center for the Study of Diversity and Democracy. Uh, I'll just highlight one more thing because she's got a very impressive and long bio which you can read, uh, which is she earned the PhD at Duke University and an MA in International Environmental Policy from the Monterey Institute of International Studies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kim Susia. Kim. Thank you. I, uh, I'm really uh, grateful for the invitation uh, to be here today and I get really nervous when I talk so I'll just tell you that now that my voice will probably shake. I tell my students this too because they're nervous but I'm sure you're not as nervous as they are when we start. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today. I'm an environmental social scientist and a lot of the questions that I ask are really around how do we structure our politics, our society, our ways of being um, in ways that shape justice experiences, primarily for frontline and fence line communities. Today, I wanted to take a little bit of a different note. Um, I've kind of moved into working with some wonderful engineer colleagues here, as well as other biophysical scientists here at Northwestern, and have been thinking a lot about how do we do the work of justice within our research? Um, and so I just wanna share with you some ideas about this today. So I'm gonna start, um, and I do have like blank slides in between, so if it's a dark slide, that's intentional <laughs> to get you to refocus. Um, but I'm gonna just start by sharing a story uh, with you. So several years ago, I was at a Science on Tap event with other academics, mostly plant geneticists, earth and atmospheric scientists, and then there's the usual sprinkling of social scientists and maybe one humanist in the room. Any of you feel that way ever? Um, and we were talking about climate related research. And one woman I met uh, told me about her work modifying the genes of soy plants to make them more adaptable to climate change, something that's really critical for dealing with the effects that climate change will have on our global food systems. So being the social scientist and awkward academic that I am, I start, um, I, I immediately tried to relate this work to work I'm familiar with, right, as we all do. In that case, this meant the politics of GMOs. So I'd asked her about recent policy changes in Southern Mexico that had banned GMOs statewide because of farmer concerns about their ability to sell their products to the European Union. And I asked her about uh, her thoughts on that and how these trends around GMO politics might impact her work. And she quipped a response clearly uncomfortable with a conversation, I'm good at that apparently. She only did the genetic science. She didn't have anything to do with what happened once her research was out in the world that wasn't her responsibility or her concern. So most of us here today pursue knowledge and its creation because we're interested and I would like to say social and ecological well-being. Like the plant geneticist, we care about making people's lives better and stewarding the earth 
and all of our older than human relatives, the lands, the waters, the plants and animals that make our human lives possible. We ask questions to fill these knowledge gaps and address the global grand challenges like climate change that shape our lives. And I start with this story because it most clearly illuminates the tensions between the normative and objective dimensions of our research. How can we generate the best science if we let normative tendencies creep into our work? No one can begrudge the plant geneticist for distancing herself from the complicated politics around GMOs. At the same time, however, at its core, all science is political and all science is driven by normative concerns. And that's probably controversial. My students kind of take a gasp when I say that. But I believe it's these politics that means we cannot abrogate our responsibility for understanding how the research that we do to advance climate solutions ultimately shapes who will benefit from and who will be worse off from our research. So in this sense, our work can have a profound impact on the way that climate change is felt and experienced across the globe. It can shape the contours of the long arc of climate justice. So climate justice is a term and a social movement familiar to many of us here. It emerged as a concept in global discussions to reflect the disproportionate benefits that industrialized nations enjoy from greenhouse gas emissions, whose costs are borne primarily by those communities in less developed countries. Can I have this water? So recent estimates that 1.2 billion people will be displaced from homes because of climate change. And these populations that are most vulnerable to climate change include indigenous peoples, women, and people living in small island developing states and least developed countries. Indeed, the UN Human Rights Commissioner estimated that in 2021 alone, 59.1 million people worldwide were displaced due to climate effects. Climate justice refers to more local phenomenon as well. Oh, it missed, it missed a slide. Ah, this is supposed to have Dan Horton's maps of Chicago. <laughs> Uh, Dan is in the back here, so pretend this is a map of Chicago and you see you see the different the I-55 and I-94 and Lakeshore Drive and you see kind of varying gradations of dark, darker color purple and and lighter color purple and the darker color purple tend to be in the south and southwest sides of Chicago or along transportation corridors and the lighter purple are say here in Evanston or Winnetka, um, but also in the nicer parts of, of Chicago. And in 1995, the city of Chicago had a heat wave that killed 1,200 people. It made huge, um, it made you know, news everywhere. And Professor Horton's research looks at how the burden of air pollution, a co-pollutant with greenhouse gas emissions, is not equally distributed among Chicago's communities. And his recent model suggests that electrification of 30% of all on-road combustion vehicles would annually save 1,000 lives, with the greatest benefits going to communities of color. And beyond these distributive effects of climate change, climate justice also refers to the effects of climate solutions on different communities. This here, is from a study published in Nature Sustainability earlier this year that found that 85% of the world's lithium reserves, a mineral that's critical for electric vehicle batteries, are on or near indigenous people's lands worldwide. The same study found that overall 54% of the minerals required for decarbonization, so that's all the minerals that Jennifer Dunn can tell us all about, um, are also on or near indigenous people's lands. Similarly, indigenous lands across the globe are home to 20% of the world's forest carbon sinks, forests that sequester on average more two times the emissions than they emit. And a recent study by the World Resources Institute shows that in the Amazon, which is the world's largest tropical forest, it's on the edge of becoming a net carbon source, emitting more emissions than it sequesters. Looking more closely at the data, it shows that it was only forests outside 
of indigenous lands that are a net source. Whereas indigenous lands inside the Amazon are net carbon sinks with much lower per hectare emissions than non-indigenous lands and similar per hectare capture. Oh, my blank slide is missing too, so. Um, <laughs> that indigenous peoples who represent less than 5% of the world's population steward 20% of the world's land that is a source for up to 85% of the mineral and carbon sinks that we need to address climate change means that we really need to attend to how our climate solutions, not just climate change, shape justice possibilities. And indeed, there's now broad consensus that effectively addressing climate solutions and climate change requires that we, as scientists, advance climate justice. So what does it mean to do this and what's our role? So while the climate injustices most visible to us are those distributive ones, like I just described, so the displacement from homes, the, experience, the disproportionate exposure to pollution, advancing climate justice really requires that we have a much deeper interrogation of the drivers of climate injustice. It requires that we as researchers, as scientists, engineers, and humanists ask ourselves how our research either reinforces or challenges the dominant power relations that produced climate change in the first place. How do we do this? Well, first, we can begin by asking how our research suppresses or elevates the concerns of what I call so-called marginalized groups, those groups that are historically underrepresented in decision making, including in our scientific venues. If, for example, we focus on electric vehicles, we should acknowledge that these solutions will have a disproportionate effect on communities where mining takes place and a disproportionate air quality benefit to those communities that can afford electric vehicles. This doesn't suggest that we shouldn't pursue electric vehicles and, that the, re and the research that will make them possible, but rather that we should acknowledge the trade-offs and think about how the patterns of representation, interpretation, and communication in our research impacts different groups' abilities to shape, participate, and benefit from our scientific processes. Sorry, water. We can ask how, in our pursuits on research on decarbonization, can we mitigate the ways in which our, re our research reinforces or addresses dominant power relations? So I'll give you an example of a project that I'm working on with Jennifer Dunn, a chemical engineer that's currently funded by the Sloan Foundation, where we ask how can we integrate indigenous worldviews into decarbonization efforts? And we do this first by asking indigenous communities what research questions they have, what values are important to them that should be reflected in the research that we do. And what this does is it, it recognizes the power that we as researchers have to shape the questions that are asked and all of which have different consequences for different groups of people. And we're finding that if we can lead with community driven questions, we can start to reshape the power relations within the research community and ultimately help to expand what I in my work call the landscapes of justice possibilities. So the second thing, let's see, oh, I have a blank slide that we can do is we can consider how our research designs and the implementation of those research designs create or limit opportunities for different groups to access and influence science and technology. And as we all know, I think the gender imbalance in science and STEM fields is, remains problematic, especially as careers advance. Um, but we also see other problems in descriptive representation across the sciences. And this actually really becomes part of an ontological and epistemological commitment that we have to make we would need to maybe expand how we think about what we can know and how we can know it. And so many folks will recall the significant harms that scientists created for black communities and indigenous communities in the US. For example, forced sterilization experiments or nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. Such harms are not completely absent from contemporary research. It's less visible and it's less demarcated. Um, but it's still a problem. In fact, when we were presenting some of our research to the Bad River Tribal Council, which is an Ojibwe nation on the banks of Lake Superior, 
the tribal council wanted us to make wanted to make sure that we understood how harmful research had been to their community for decades and that we were not welcome to reproduce those harms. Um, and so one of the things why this matters, it doesn't just matter for the relationships between us as researchers and tribal communities, for example, it actually matters for what we know and how we know it. So I'd like to share something that Marvin Defoe shared with me. He's an elder of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And a few years ago, as part of our NSF funded project, a group of Northwestern researchers, including myself and Jennifer Dunn and many others, were working to build relationships with Ojibwe nations across the Western Great Lakes. And we, we wanted to learn about what questions and concerns they had about climate change and their resilience to it. And we were specifically trying to find questions find out which questions of theirs we could actually answer. You know, we're not uh, the end all be all of all things climate related, um, but we, we might be able to answer some of them. And so Marvin shared this story with us about working with the Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin to determine the dates that lakes could be open for spearfishing. And he was talking about how the Department of Natural Resources would come to him and say, you know, the water temperature has reached this point. It means that on this date, we can open the waters for fishing. And Marvin said, they're nowhere near ready to be open for fishing. They need more time. And the, the Department of Natural Resources said, yeah, but we have this calendar and we have this water temperature and we know that by this date, it will be fine. And so they opened the waters for fishing. Well, the fish weren't there. They weren't ready yet. And a few weeks later, the frogs started chirping. And he said, now the lake is ready for us to start fishing. And sure enough, he went and the Department of Natural Resources staff said, oh, you were right. The lakes weren't ready. Now the fish are ready. Maybe we should have listened to Marvin and his decades and generations of expertise. And so he shared this, Marvin shared this to illustrate what he feels is one of the biggest threats to climate resilience in his community, namely that scientists and policymakers do not hear and they do not listen to the knowledge that indigenous peoples generate and steward. And so in this sense, Marvin was pointing out that we often ask the wrong questions and try to answer these questions without understanding how to answer them. He noted that the exper experiential, longitudinal and systematic observations that constitute indigenous knowledge offer a much broader range of possible approaches to climate change than Western science is capable of seeing. Research designs that embrace two-eyed seeing, one eye indigenous, one eye Western, are likely to not only broaden participation in decarbonization science and engineering, but ignite new solutions to climate change. Two more ideas. The third one comes from a recent, recent conversation with Jeff Huang, a postdoctoral scholar who's somewhere in the back. <laughs> um, Jeff is new to Northwestern and the Department of Political Science, and, he's, and they are working on our NSF-funded STRONG project. And I asked what they think scientists should consider in their work to advance climate justice, because I was preparing for this talk as we drove back a really long way from Wisconsin last week. And they suggested that we as scientists ask how we can use our positions as scientists and engineers to engage politically. Here, Jeff was pointing not only to how we might communicate our science to policymakers, but rather consider the political opportunities that we as researchers have to shape decision making and to shape whose lives improve and whose lives don't. How can we, for example, get policymakers to allocate more funding for community driven research in the National Science Foundation? How might we discuss research findings in ways that attend more explicitly to their hidden political dimensions as a way to unveil the ways that our research benefits some ways of being more than others and also prompt action? So lastly, I want to suggest one, I think, relatively simple way to think about what we might do as scientists and engineers playing, playing a role in shaping the arc of climate, the arc of justice of climate solutions. And this is to shift our approaches to research from our more transactional traditions 
where our, where our research is driven by our interest in solving global problems, but ultimately the why of how our research is shaped by the incentives our institutions provide, namely the self-interested, the incentives to be self-interested. For example, getting tenure, getting credit, getting more money, these are all good things. We all need them to do good research and to have our job and to keep our jobs. But addressing climate change, addressing a problem like climate change requires what social scientists call deep collaboration. Deep collaboration is when actors like those in this Toronto Northwestern Decarbonization Alliance commit to behavior changes and action that advance collective interests at the cost of our individual interests. So for example, governments could commit to producing 75% of their energy through renewables, which would cost them quite a bit if other governments aren't doing that, but they could do that, right? They could. So this type of collaboration really is only possible when relationships are driven by shared commitments rather than self-interest. And we have to, I would argue, begin to really operate this way in the academy. How could we cultivate such transformational relationships? So one example of this committing to transformational relationships or to, to developing transformational relationships is by committing to transdisciplinary research. Often people sort of conflate transdisciplinary research with interdisciplinary research or multidisciplinary research. What transdisciplinary research does differently is it pushes us outside the walls of the academy and tries to even out some of the power relationships within research partnerships. And so thus far what I've shared is, are actually different aspects of transdisciplinary research. What questions do we ask? How do we ask them? And what do we do with the findings? So to bring this together, I wanted to share this example from our strong project and the worldview that shapes the research questions that we ask. Well, first I should clarify that we only ask the questions our communities have asked us to ask, um, but the, we embed them within the Ojibwe uh, worldview of four orders. So the four orders, I don't know if you can read it very clearly, but at the center is the physical world. This is the world of rocks, air, and water. Outside of that is the plant world, which is dependent on the physical world. Uh, for nutrients and for its growth, and the physical world is re re reliant on the plant world to maintain sort of soil health, etc. Then the animal world, which is reliant on both the plant and the physical world, and the physical and plant world are also reliant on the animal world. And then the outside world is the human world. No other worlds depend on us, right? We depend on all the other worlds. So how do we ask questions about this? Typical science might pick one variable to isolate in one of these worlds and try to figure out how it's interacting with another variable or set of variables. Where we're trying to direct our research is understanding those relationships between the worlds and what kinds of things strengthen or weaken the relationships between the worlds. So sometimes this is a human relationship with water. Sometimes it's a bird relationship with rice. And we're trying to figure out how do we actually measure these things in order to better explain and understand resilience to climate change. So I'm going to sort of start to wrap up here. I hope these were somewhat more tangible than most of my talks, maybe not, but I have ideas for you if you need them. Um, but I want to start to sort of move towards, well, this might sound a little off the cuff, and then sometimes I think people will think I'm so radical they'll never invite me again, and then they do. Um, but in 2020, 500 scientists, women scientist leaders, wrote in Scientific American, if one of the objectives of science is to serve society, then scientists must ask themselves which parts of society are we serving and who is the we to begin with. So today I've outlined four key ideas for scientists and engineers to consider when advancing research and knowledge on climate change and decarbonization. So my key point is this, from the questions that we ask to the questions that we don't ask, scientists and engineers play a huge role in determining who will experience justice and injustice as the world grapples with climate change. We have to understand climate change not as primarily a technical or biophysical problem, 
We have to understand it. As Knives Dolsek and Asim Prakash put it, it's the most complex political challenge facing humanity. It is first and foremost a political problem. And we as researchers can help redefine its contours to advance justice first in order to shape meaningful and effective solutions. So one of the key lessons um, that I hope my students take away from my environmental politics and policy courses is that whoever defines the problem that we're trying to address gets to define the solutions. And this is where so much of the power in politics is sourced. So if we define climate change as a problem without recognizing how politics shapes that definition, we're complicit in generating the inevitable climate injustices that result. So I reiterate sort of this framework for justice that we might consider in our work as scientists, that we can, like social movements, attend to the procedural, distributive, and recognitional dimensions of justice in our research by asking how our practices and procedures of science impact how different groups access and influence our research, how the distributions of benefits and harms associated with our work can shape people's lived experiences, and how the patterns of representation, interpretation, and communication impact different groups' abilities to shape, participate, and influence, uh, participate in and benefit from our scientific decision processes. So I'm gonna close with one of the 20th century's greatest leaders who advanced justice. You might have noted, that, noted this homage to Martin Luther King Jr. in the title of this talk. So in 1965, Martin Luther King Jr. was speaking at Oberlin College, and he said this, he reiterated this sentiment many times in, in, in subsequent speeches. And he spoke of the arc of the moral universe as being long, but bending towards justice. And when he made this initial declaration, he issued a call for humankind to recognize its interconnectedness. He said, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are who you ought to be. And you can never be who you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. And at that particular moment, Martin Luther King Jr. may not have foreshadowed the climate change challenge that we have created, but his insights into our shared destiny resonate as much today as they did then. And in the absence of recognition of this shared destiny and the development of what he would call a coalition of conscience, we won't rid ourselves of these climate challenges and the very real harms that our choices as scientists and engineers can generate. Our work can have such a profound impact on the way that climate change is felt and experienced across the globe. Thank you. Well, again, we have time for a bit of a discussion, a few questions from the audience. And so I'll start right with the first question from the audience after you, sir. Hi, thanks very much. Very enlightening, of course. Uh, let's take the south side of Chicago. How would your, um, your approaches apply there? And where would uh, dealing with uh, climate change rank with the other social injustices there, crime, education, health? Great, thank you for that question. Um, and if, if Dan wants to add anything, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Dan. Um, so the way, you know, if I were, if I don't do work with communities in Chicago, but if I were doing work with communities in Chicago, I would first go and ask them, what questions do you have that would shape your ability to respond to climate change? All communities are gonna have really different answers, right? For some communities, it's going to be, we need to feel safe in our homes, right? So maybe it's thinking about, um, how community systems can be strengthened in order to reduce crime that's happening in their neighborhood. Perhaps some communities will say, well, we really need to be able to get to work on time. And so the red line extension, you know, 
to the south that's going further south of 95 would be something that they want to figure out how do they best you know get there and use it to get to work so i guess the first thing i would do is ask those questions and then ask them well how should we answer these who should we be asking who should be involved i think for me fundamentally it's about developing those relationships with communities and i also don't think that any of the social challenges that the people on the south side face are distinct from climate change climate change is exacerbating um, some of those immediate experiences but it's also those those social challenges are a product of the same system that has created climate change right it's about power imbalances and the ways in which certain communities lives are valued more than others so i guess i would sort of suggest that we not see climate change, we, we not sort of pit climate change against other problems, because I think addressing any of those other problems would also help resilience to climate change. And addressing climate change would help those other problems. Um, does that help? Thanks, Kim. Annalise. I wanted to ask you about, um, say a little more about the relational approach that you talked about at the end, and in particular in relationship to your work with humanists on the one hand and st the STEM fields on the other. So on the humanists, I was thinking of the talk that we just um, heard from Imra when he talked about energy as a relationship. And he seemed to be talking especially about uh, labor relations and relations of inequality, economic relations. So I'm wondering wh what whether you want to enter a dialogue with him on the humanistic side. And then on the STEM side, you talked about how this approach is different than, say, picking out, isolating a variable and then figuring out how it relates to other variables and so on. As you're engaging with folks like Jennifer and colleagues in the STEM side, how does this relational approach translate into a different approach to doing STEM-based research? What does it look like differently when you're actually figuring out the hard science, I hate that term, but hard science of it, so to speak. Thanks. I would love to have more conversations with Imra. I love geographers, the ultimate interdisciplinary discipline. Um, I think in the in the ways that um, that I understood Imra to be talking about relationships, it's similar in the sense of relations are are the phenomenon through which we produce things we produce reality we produce justice and injustice um, and so in a certain sense i think that what humanities and social sciences can do together is really expand and i like to use this word lance or this phrase landscapes of possibilities because i think we're often so constrained by what we see now as being what should be versus what ought to be or what could be and I think humanities can really bring in that kind of imagination space for us to be much more creative and risk taking in our work. I think I would defer to Jennifer on the question of how it shapes her research differently. Um, I can try to take a stab, Jennifer, and then you can let me know. She wants me to go for it. She's a chemical engineer. And we just did this tour of a molybdenum mine or molybdenum facility, which I did not understand at all. It was way over my head. Um, but one of the things that we're working on are our, um, Jennifer does life cycle assessment of different technologies and processes. Um, and one of the uh, sort of two of the real core missing things that I understand from life cycle analysis that are missing are real biodiversity measures and social measures. And there have been, as she would say, some attempts to address these, but they're fairly inadequate. And they don't actually prioritize what might be the most important local impacts, right, on communities. So for example, um, we're working with two tribal nations in Minnesota, the Fond du Lac Band of Ojibwe and the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, um, and they are both facing uh, mines, new mines. One is called, what was it called? Polymet, but the Tamarack Mine has this amazing, or Talon Mine has this amazing, PR campaign about how they're going to electrify Minnesota with their mine. Um, but the community, Mill Lax, is really not on board with this, right? Because of the potential impacts not only on water quality and biodiversity, but on Ojibwe ways of being. Um, and so, what we're doing in that work 
with her graduate student Maggie O'Connell, who I don't think is here, um, um, is creating with, co-creating with our partners um, measurable indicators that could be involved in the life cycle analysis in order to better at least evaluate the real range of impacts um, that, they, that they will experience. And that's a tool for decision makers to really make them confront the realities of these, um, of these processes. She thumbed up me, me th you thumbed me up. <laughs> Other questions for Kim? Yeah, go on. Yeah, I was, uh, oh, I was struck by the kind of uh, justice possibilities and, you know, like this aspect of like uh, our imaginations being con kind of constrained. And it seems to me that it's going to be, there's going to be a, like a lot of difficulties and a lot of experimentation for people to work together, scientists, engineers, et cetera. And so I was wondering if you could speak to the, you know, lessons from failure. Like what is the role of failure in kind of thinking about these relationships and changing our religions? Because it's not gonna be a, you know, easy thing to widen our imaginations. I think that's a two finger on that, yeah. I want to thank you first because you are saving me a lot of what I wanted to say tomorrow. So thank you for that, for a great presentation. But I, I, I also wonder what you could say about the barriers you have faced. Because one thing is to say, oh, let's change our mental models, guys. Let's do things differently. Let's change the rules of the game. But the other is to change them. And you, as a amazing political scientists that are. I mean, you could tell us something about that. That would be great. OK, sure. So I'll try to, um, no pun intended, do your question justice, Jeff. <laughs> um, what's the role of failure? I think that you know, we could look at the way, I, I would say we failed, right? We're failing as academic researchers, as teachers, as scientists and as communities to really grapple seriously with climate change. We're not doing it. And I, I think it was Maggie O'Connell the other day who said, man, I would be a lot happier if I were a climate denier, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I would feel nice for a weekend. Um, <laughs> but I think that we can, I think that failure can point out where our current kind of, where are we bumping up against, right? the change that needs to happen. Um, because I think if we feel like we're making a little bit of incremental progress, we're not pushing hard enough. Um, I tell my daughter that if she doesn't fall when she's skiing, she's not trying hard enough, right? And so I think we need to fall a lot more. And I talk with Annalise about this a lot, like the need for risk. Our research should be taking big risks. If it's not, what are we doing, right? We are not here to like, well, I guess some people might be here because they love the life of the professor. Um, I hope most of us are here because we, we really love the pursuit of knowledge and the ways in which knowledge can transform our world. Um, and so I think failure for me is that we need to push up against it and try to really engage that failure. Um, in terms of how we have failed, or maybe the challenges we faced in our project, um, you know, time is honestly the biggest um, can, the biggest hurdle for us because relationship building takes time and the academic clock doesn't really care, right? And so we, um, I mean, I guess I can thank the pandemic for giving me a one-year tenure clock extension. That was lovely. Not that I actually had more time during the pandemic, um, but, um, but I think that to cultivate the kind of research that we need, we need to give more leeway and more value to those things that are less product-based and more relationship-based. Um, and that, I would say though, here at Northwestern, um, I feel like I've, I, you know, I've stuck to what my core beliefs are and that's actually served me well. So they didn't fire me um, and now they're stuck with me for the rest of my career apparently, um, unless they cut my department, which I don't think they will. Um, 
you got to be strategic in your career choices. So that's what I would sort of say on the, the biggest challenge is time. And our, and our tribal community members, they really want us to be there, right? They don't want us to like pop in and pop out. And I just don't have a lot of time. Thank you, Kim. We'll, we'll have to keep this discussion going at the coffee break. So for now, please join me in thanking Kim for a wonderful talk and discussion. <laughs> And I have a pleasure, just before we move into our break, of introducing one more speaker. Uh, I, we're very pleased to have with us the Provost of Northwestern University, uh, Professor Kathleen Hagerty. Uh, Kathleen, over to you. All right, thank you, Ted. Um, I wanna thank Ted and Michael and our team here at Northwestern for hosting this um, inventive and forward-thinking event. And as well to thank and welcome our partners from Toronto, um, in particular, Dave Stinton, Gwen Burroughs, and our other guests from Canada. And we're delighted to have you here as partners in our fight against global warming. I'd also like to thank our keynote speakers. So Imra Zeman and Kim Sosia. Kim's here. So Kim, your job is safe. Political science is safe. Don't worry. So, uh, oh, there's Megan. Hey, Megan. Okay, so yeah, so you're safe, I can tell you that, so, um, so don't worry. Okay, so this year marks a significant milestone in the university's global strategy with the launch of two new global social innovation hubs. First, this one, the Toronto Northwestern Decarbonization Alliance, which aims to drive research and dialogue on decarbonization with the goal of combating carbon emissions, so obviously a very, very noble goal. In addition, we're opening a second Northwestern hub in September with the University of Tokyo that will focus on the culture of artificial intelligence. These two hubs will demonstrate that effective solutions are only possible with researchers, government officials, and when industry leaders collaborate. Both of these hubs will also offer diverse opportunities for joint research and for our students, which is very important since they are the ones who are gonna have to live with all the problems we're leaving them with. The Toronto Northwestern Decarbonization Alliance is a great example of Northwestern's pursuit to enhance our intellectual eminence and impact while building our research enterprise. So it's really important to have the two things together. And I think the effort that's being led here with help from Ted in particular is a perfect example of that. This particular alliance indicates our commitment to taking collaboration and international partnership approach to strengthening our global network of partnerships. So we're doing a good thing in partnership with a lot of people. We are proud to solidify our partnership with Canada's top university. I was, when I said top university, I was thinking, do we really? We, we mean that, right? We do mean that. Okay, I agree with that. Okay, my husband is a, my husband's a Canadian, and so we often, and he's from Alberta, so, but, um, so we have to make sure that we're being fair to all Canadians, but I do think probably you were right, right? Okay. Um, we are also excited to work with you to tackle one of the world's most pressing challenges, and that is absolutely the case, and I think we spent a lot of time here thinking about that thinking about how we can contribute to this problem, thinking about how we can train our students to attack this problem. And this is the group that I feel the worst about and I worry the most about is our students because they're, we're leaving them with these problems. Uh, the interdisciplinary group here represents scientists, engineers, energy researchers, social scientists, and experts in environmental policy, global studies, communications, and law. And we're all here to learn from each other and to bring new knowledge into the global community desperately in need of answers. And that's an understatement. So I want to thank everybody here for doing your part. And now it's time for your break, right? So you get to go out, have a break, and then come back and get to work.